Good evening and welcome to the Chevy Chase Historical Society's Spring 2021 Lecture with Professor William Rowley on the founder of Chevy Chase, Francis G. Newlands. Good evening everyone and welcome to our Spring Lecture. My name is Mary Sheehan and I am president of the Chevy Chase Historical Society. On behalf of our entire board, I want to thank you for joining us this evening as we take a closer look at the founder of our community, Francis G. Newlands. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker, Professor William Rowley. Professor Rowley is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Nevada in Reno, where he joined the faculty more than four decades ago. His teaching there has been in the fields of the American West, Nevada history, and the American and, and American environmental history. And he is past chair of the university's history department. He holds both a master's degree and a PhD in history from the University of Nebraska. In addition to teaching, Professor Rowley is a prolific researcher. Based on that research, he has authored numerous books and articles on the history of politics, the economy, and the management of precious water resources in the Western United States. These include his seminal biography of Francis Newlands, titled Reclaiming the Arid West, the Career of Francis G. Newlands. And I have told Professor Raleigh that his book is dog-eared with use at the CCHS archive. In addition to books and articles, Professor Raleigh has presented numerous papers at academic conferences, written almost 100 book reviews for academic journals, and served as the editor for the Nevada Historical Society Quarterly for almost 20 years. His other professional activities include many years of serving on the governing boards of several nationwide history societies. And finally, he has served as the local coordinator for federal grants to promote the teaching of history and to provide professional development for teachers of American history. So we are honored to have you with us tonight, Professor Rowley, all the way from your home in Reno. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mary, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to speak to the Chevy Chase Historical Society tonight. And thank you for the invitation. Good evening. My remarks tonight are largely based on, as mentioned, my 1996 book on Newlands, Reclaiming the Arid West, the career of Francis G. Newlands. My previous articles over the last uh, several years or decades actually in the Nevada Historical Society Quarterly and my thinking over the last 25 years about the questions posed by Newlands's life story. I chose the title of this evening's talk, Francis G. Newlands, uh, A Search for a Progressive and White America, from one of those earlier articles that preceded the book, as we note in this image. Francis Newlands's dates are from 1848 to 1917. That fateful parentheses uh, behind each of our names, of course. Dates range from, or these dates range from the Civil War into World War I, when the United States projected its national power across the Atlantic onto the European continent. The Union victory in the Civil War, of course, during these dates, held the Federal Republic together as one nation and kept it from being split apart over the issue of slavery, not just the simple question of states' rights, as the story has been portrayed so often in the textbooks of American history in the early 20th century, uh, and for maybe for most of the 20th century. The years after the Civil War witnessed an intense scale of industrialization in the United States, in transportation, communication, and in the means of production from manufacturers to mining and even agriculture. So much was the impact of this industrialization that historians have characterized the period in terms of America's response to industrialism. It was a response to a chaotic, wild and extravagant nation 
uh, that was creating great wealth and at the same time, great disparity between the wealthy and the poor. In between were the growing and frustrated aspirations of the middle class, the desires for upward mobility, the rewards of professionalization, and the emergence of some sort of order out of the chaos, or at least a desire for order out of the chaos and uncertainty all around. Where was the future going became the question that was filled with anxiety. Could there be an ordered outcome? So much so that one historian, Robert Wiebe in 1966, a uh, book about the era or the progressive era ultimately uh, was, in, uh, was entitled uh, A Search for Order from 1877 to 1920. And of course, these are the important and productive adult years of Newlands's life. And of course, uh, we always, when we refer to the late 19th century, the years after the Civil War, we must always make mention of Mark Twain's label for that uh, disturbing period of history or wild uh, period of history, the Gilded Age. Uh, it remains a durable marker. Uh, so does the term robber Barrett. I had to throw that in. Uh, my point tonight, however, in this introduction is that Newlands's wish to be part of a progressive response to industrialism in the progressive era after 1900. And he needed a US Senate seat from Nevada, the neighbor of California to do that. To him, it meant access to the most exclusive men's club in America. He embraced progressivism in terms of its representing modernization for the nation, public improvements, planning, especially urban planning, economic development, science, professionalization, meritocracy, and notably, if I can throw this in, the Wisconsin idea, using expertise to solve problems, the expertise of the universities to address social, economic, and political reforms. We have evidence of that even in Nevada on the part of Newlands. Progressivism to him also meant efficiency in the use of resources and the desirability of higher standards of public morality and in the efficiency of government and the political system that sustained it. On the latter point, he launched a campaign that objected to the concept of a multiracial democracy. It posed great problems for the efficient operation of democratic government in his view. And perhaps democratic government could not be conducted in a racial democracy. One suspects that he was uh, that there was a kernel of Anglo-Saxonism in all of this, in terms of only Anglo-Saxons are capable of stable democratic government. It's sort of in the genes, uh, if you will. Well, Newlands, while growing up poor in genteel poverty, achieved through ability and serendipity, I guess, great power and influence how he chose to use that wealth in these years, that wealth, power, and influence is going to be the subject of tonight's talk. Let me now turn to a narrative of Newlands's uh, life, those years, 1848 to uh, 1917. Uh, let's begin in Scotland. Uh, his uh, family, uh, emigrated from Scotland in the 1840s. Uh, his father was a physician, physician, a physician uh, having uh, a, been educated in Edinburgh. He served in India for the British uh, and then returned uh, to Scotland to marry. But he was afflicted, and let's get this uh, 
open right away with alcoholism. Uh, and their decision to emigrate almost immediately in the 1840s to the United States was looked upon as a, uh, a new start and perhaps things would be different and he could overcome uh, his affliction. They ended up, first of all, in Troy, New York, and then uh, in uh, Natchez, Mississippi, where Newlands was born uh, in 1848, ultimately becoming a part of a family uh, with five children. Uh, things did not work out in Natchez, uh, uh, Mississippi, and uh, the Newlands family had to take uh, a move uh, to Illinois, to Quincy, Illinois, a thriving river town. There, Newlands' father's affliction continued, and in 1851, uh, he died, leaving uh, Jesse Barland, Newlands, alone uh, with five uh, fairly young children. She, however, immediately uh, married the ex-mayor of the city. He was a banker, uh, kind of prosperous, and they started to enjoy the uh, middle-class life in uh, Natchez uh, or, or in uh, Quincy, Illinois. This is uh, going to not occur uh, or not uh, endure very long because a banking depression is going to come in 1857 uh, and uh, the family's prosperity is wiped out. Uh, the father, or not the father, but the, uh, the stepfather, you might say, uh, gets a low paying political job in Chicago. Uh, through the influence of one Orville H. Browning, an interesting figure in Illinois, who is going to be an important um, uh, role model, you might say, for uh, Newlands when he, is, when he is growing up. And uh, Browning is actually, has connections with Abraham Lincoln uh, in Illinois. He succeeds Stephen Douglas, and when C Stephen Douglas dies, uh, in 1861, he succeeds Stephen Douglas in the Senate. And this is the Stephen Douglas of the Lincoln-Douglas uh, debates of 1858. Uh, so he is fairly highly uh, connected uh, in, uh, in Illinois. And uh, he ultimately gets um, uh, Ebenezer Moore, the uh, 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 Jesse's new husband, an appointment to the Treasury Department as a clerk in Washington, DC. And this is how the Newlands family, uh, Newlands Moore family gets to Washington, uh, D.C. under sort of the guidance of uh, uh, Orville H. Uh, Browning. Uh, there, um, uh, they thrive for a while, even making plans for Newlands to go to Yale, which he does for one year. But then um, Ebenezer Moore dies uh, in 1866 really leaving the family in straightened circumstances. Jesse Moore even has to take in borders uh, to maintain some uh, uh, lifestyle uh, in the late 1860s. Newlands has to leave Yale, his uh, happiest, gladdest year uh, at, at, in, in college, and come back to Washington, DC, work in the postal department, and go to school uh, for a law degree at what will become George Washington University. Uh, and he achieves uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, his goal of passing the bar in Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, uh, Orville Browning is going to be appointed Secretary of the Interior in the Johnson administration. And he very much is in sync with Johnson's view. Uh, 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 President Johnson, of course, is the successor to Abraham Lincoln after his assassination and is essentially a border state uh, Democrat uh, with uh, generally uh, 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 not radical Republican views, let's put it this way, on the future of Blacks uh, in, in the South, uh, and will be a, a, a critic of the 14th Amendment and certainly the 15th Amendment uh, uh, to the um, uh, Constitution that is a product of radical Republicanism uh, after the uh, Civil War uh, in uh, Reconstruction. Uh, and uh, Orville Browning basically uh, introduces Newlands to polite society in Washington, and you can sort of imagine that he becomes fascinated with uh, Washington life and government and how it operates uh, in the nation's capital. But 
uh, the Johnson administration is going to be done by 1869 and Newlands is going to have his law degree and he looks for new horizons. Uh, he looks for a place to make his fortune and he chooses San Francisco and goes to San Francisco uh, in, the, uh, in the 1870s. Uh, he arrives in San Francisco uh, in uh, 1870 with $70 in his, uh, uh, in his uh, purse, uh, not uh, uh, an insignificant sum uh, at that time, and immediately begins his law degree uh, in the period. Uh, becoming somewhat uh, successful, so much so that is that he is able to bring uh, his mother uh, to San Francisco. She had uh, been uh, uh, stayed in Washington, or uh, uh, and and had a, a very difficult uh, uh, years after the death of her second husband uh, in Washington. As I've sort of indicated, she not only had to take in boarders, she was taking care of the oldest uh, son who had been wounded. Uh, very severely in the Civil War, and he eventually died, and that kind of left a pall over the uh, uh, over the family. And I think uh, Newlands kind of resented the Civil War, and his view from some letters in the 1860s suggested uh, that uh, he kind of envied uh, the South and Southerners in their struggle in, in the uh, Civil War because they fought for ideals. Uh, and uh, for the defense of their homeland and uh, for their society and for their traditions. And I suppose one of those traditions is slavery or at least keeping uh, blacks in a subordinate role. Whereas the North didn't seem to have any really idealistic goals or fiery uh, patriotic goals to fight for uh, in this war. So this was kind of Newland, as I detected, the kind of Newlands's view of the Civil War, and it was certainly shaped, I think, by Orville Browning too. Uh, and now uh, he's in San Francisco, uh, in a in a law practice. Uh, he is uh, uh, he's he has uh, cultivated manners, uh, and he's sort of welcomed into what uh, one person has called the Parvenu Society of San Francisco. He starts dating the, uh, the daughters of uh, some very wealthy men uh, in uh, San Francisco, uh, one of whom was uh, the daughter of William uh, Sharon. Uh, and if we might, yes, there we have, uh, William Sharon. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, Sharon is going to be a really uh, a very, very uh, rich person by 1882 having gained uh, most of his wealth from the Virginia City mines that we call the Comstock mines uh, in Nevada. The Comstock was discovered in 1859, 1860, and it's going to produce wealth into the late 1870s. It starts declining in 1877 and is pretty much on the downhill by 1880, but the wealth has been made and a lot of it went into the pocket uh, of William Sharon and the Sharon fortune. And the Sharon fortune is essentially uh, one of the largest fortunes on the Pacific coast and Newlands marries into it uh, uh, in 1882. Uh, and this, um, uh, uh, or I mean, I'm sorry, not in 1882. Uh, he marries into it in 1874, uh, four years after his arrival uh, in, um, uh, in California. Uh, I don't know why 1882 suddenly slipped into uh, my um, uh, uh, timeline there, uh, but uh, uh, he uh, uh, is immediately catapulted into the power circles uh, of, uh, of San Francisco. Uh, and uh, Sharon sort of starts viewing him as I might think of in terms of the consigliori uh, of the family. Uh, he, uh, uh, employs him in the defense of the state's problem or of the S of the Sharon fortune's problems in California, uh, defending uh, the property, defending the corporation uh, against uh, all uh, people that might have claim upon it. Uh, and uh, in other words, furthering uh, the, uh, uh, the Sharon fortune uh, in, uh, in California. 
in these uh, in these years, uh, there are uh, uh, he marries Clara Sharon. I, I said in 1874, and in these same years, Sharon becomes senator, U.S. senator from uh, Nevada, uh, and he spends a good deal of time in Washington D.C. Very few uh, days in the Senate, however, he is notorious for not attending any Senate meetings. I think he spends more time sort of scouting real estate around uh, Washington, DC, and that's sort of his legacy uh, in the capital city. Uh, <clears throat> but um, uh, meanwhile, uh, back in San Francisco, uh, uh, Newlands, fa Newlands' family grows. He has two daughters. Uh, and in 1882, however, the third in the birth of the third daughter, uh, 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 Clara Sharon dies, leaving him a widower uh, with three, uh, small, uh, three small daughters. But he's still in the Sharon family here. Uh, and here is the uh, uh, Newlands with his in-laws uh, in Yosemite uh, uh, sometime before the death of uh, uh, Clara Sharon. Uh, the man in the, um, uh, um, uh, so I don't know, what would you say, the combat suit there almost uh, is um, uh, uh, Sir Thomas Hesketh. Uh, who married one of the daughters uh, of Sharon, very typical of the uh, English aristocracy of the period, marrying wealthy daughters uh, of uh, wealthy men uh, in America. I think uh, uh, we saw indications of that in the recent television series, uh, Downton Abbey. There were, uh, that, that was the circumstances uh, in, in Downton Abbey, of course. Uh, but anyway, uh, Newlands is uh, now a widower in the mid 1880s in California. Uh, he is um, uh, uh, still kind of the uh, servant of uh, the Sharon, uh, Sharon fortune, uh, defending it in California. He's also getting political ambitions uh, himself. Uh, there does arise a very sort of what uh, Newlands called a very wretched case when uh, um, uh, Aletha uh, um, uh, Hill, uh, uh, who was um, Sharon's uh, mistress, uh, decides to sh sue him in a common law divorce suit and uh, out, uh, with, with the obvious uh, uh, goal of obtaining a share uh, of the Sharon fortune uh, in the divorce. And Newlands is going to have to be called upon uh, to uh, defend the state in that uh, uh, divorce uh, trial. Sarah Aletha uh, Hill is, is her name. It was a very prominent trial uh, in San Francisco. Uh, statewide newspapers carried it, nationwide newspapers carried it, and even some of the European uh, 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 papers uh, referred to it and uh, ran stories on it because, because there were some very dramatic uh, court scenes. Uh, uh, and during the trial in 1885, uh, Sharon dies, uh, leaving the Sharon estate uh, essentially to Newlands, but he's executor of the estate uh, for uh, the three daughters. But he's essentially in command uh, of the state after uh, the estate after 1885. Uh, and uh, he also has a political ambitions. Now there is problems with the divorce case. Um, his uh, friend uh, and also a consultant in the trial, Senator uh, William Morris of uh, Nevada is going to advise him to change residencies, to put the uh, case into, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, in, into diverse citizenship so that it could be tried in federal court because they did not know if they could win in state court. And uh, so Newlands had a reason to change the citi his citizenships to some other state than California. At the same time, he was also generally shut out of democratic politics. He's a Democrat in California, a shut out of democratic politics in California uh, and is uh, seeking another venue, another avenue uh, for a national political career. Uh, Senator Stewart advises Nevada, for after all, Nevada is a rotten borough. It is a pocket borough, actually, of, Cal of California. Uh, and uh, 
by that I mean uh, it's a state with a population of just over 40,000. Uh, but it yet has full representation in Washington uh, and, in the con uh, and in the Congress of the United States. Uh, and um, Newman's is going to consider all of this uh, on a trip, it's kind of a vacation from all of the uh, happenings in late 1880s in California to his uh, brother-in-law's estate in the Kent uh, countryside, uh, Sir Thomas uh, Hesketh's estate in the Kent uh, countryside in England during 1888. And there he meets a house guest of the family, uh, a San Francisco socialite, uh, Edith McAllister. Uh, they become interested, romantically interested in one another, uh, and they marry in England uh, in 1888. Uh, and they travel home uh, to California. Newlands makes the decision that the move, if he's going to get out of California, that the move will be to Nevada, not to New York or anywhere else, but uh, to Nevada. It seemed the logical place and it seemed that he would have certain opportunities, particularly backed by his great wealth in the politics or the political arena uh, of, of Nevada. Uh, they come to Nevada, uh, new, or Senator Stewart advises him to build kind of a nice home uh, in uh, Nevada to show his, uh, that he is putting down roots here, uh, that he's not a sort of mere carpetbagger in the state. And, uh, and Newlands is, is uh, very uh, receptive of that advice and cognizant of the fact that he does not want uh, to um, uh, have a mere, what he called a mere soldier, a Sharon sojourn in the state, or to repeat the kind of uh, non-entity political career uh, that his uh, father-in-law had in the state in the 1870s. Uh, and he builds his house, I guess in, uh, as we see on the screen here, uh, in the Queen Anne style, as I understand, uh, it is the uh, architectural style. Uh, it is, he, they planted fruit trees and so on, uh, and it sort of announces his uh, permanency uh, in, um, uh, in Nevada. Now, um, <clears throat> he wants a political career in Nevada. He would certainly like to have the senatorship or one of the senatorships from uh, Nevada. Uh, here we have him in the house with two of his having uh, dinner, I suppose, uh, or tea with two of his daughters uh, in, in uh, Reno uh, at their home. Uh, but he does want a political career uh, in Nevada. He would certainly like a senatorship, but it is occupied, and rather permanently so, one seat by uh, Senator Stewart, another seat by uh, Senator John Jones, who is essentially kind of a carpetbagger. He lives in Santa Monica, uh, but, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, enjoy the sort of uh, uh, sophisticated life of the, uh, of the upper classes. But Newlands has a great deal of money to deal uh, with here. Uh, he uh, is already uh, starting to look at the properties in Washington, D.C. and the possibilities of investments around Washington, uh, Washington D.C. In other words, he's going to start launching by 17 or by 1890 uh, a, his business, a land company in the Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, area. He hasn't quite gotten political office from Nevada yet. Uh, that's going to take until uh, uh, 1892 when he does win uh, Nevada's one congressional seat uh, to Congress uh, under the banner of the Republican Party. When he comes to Nevada, he uh, uh, becomes a Republican. In Nevada, he also uh, is uh, uh, interested in um, uh, the um, uh, not just buying his way into a Nevada politics, which uh, was, which is what everyone expected him to do. Uh, he ex they just expected him to buy the Nevada legislature because uh, uh, in, in terms of a Senate seat, but he couldn't quite do that uh, with both Senator Jones and Stewart rather permanently ensconced uh, in those seats. So he had to uh, seek and actually do some campaigning and spend a lot of money on newspapers uh, in the state to get this congressional seat. So I guess this congressional seat uh, wins the election uh, in 1892 
and uh, uh, goes back to uh, uh, Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, and uh, of course, joins uh, Stuart and others in, in, in Washington. Uh, and um, there he uh, immediately knows that he has to have a home, a home uh, for entertainment. Uh, and first of all, he buys the uh, Woodley Mansion, uh, which he doesn't really live in in the 18. Uh, 90s, and he also builds a home in his new land development in Maryland in Chevy Chase Circle. And this is going to be basically the home out of which uh, he entertains um, uh, imper important personalities and, uh, and, and uh, advocates for programs and enter entertains with breakfasts and dinners and so on uh, with his new wife. Uh, and uh, and uh, in in Washington D.C., he cut quite, quite, quite he cut quite a figure uh, in uh, D.C. Uh, society uh, with his uh, now political office that puts him in Washington, and also uh, his businesses that are going to start uh, thriving uh, there. But his businesses are not going to thrive that much uh, because 1893 uh, is going to bring uh, the depression of the 18. Uh, of the 1890s. And this is going to uh, severely um, um, uh, uh, constrict uh, the activities of the land company. It's not going to return on the investment. Stewart was one of the investors in the company uh, and he's going to be rather put off because there's nothing coming back from his uh, investments. And it's going to lay the foundations for uh, uh, the fallout between Newlands and Senator Stewart, the man who had originally uh, sort of uh, had uh, uh, really argued that Nevada was the best residency for uh, Newlands outside of California, both for his political career and for the businesses of the Sharon uh, estate. Uh, and you can see here that uh, lots are for sale and 1893, as I mentioned, is the uh, depression. Uh, and uh, there's going to be uh, uh, various, um, uh, act, but there's still going to be various activities uh, in the building uh, of, of Chevy Chase in the 1890s. And meanwhile, um, Newlands is trying to uh, secure his base in, uh, in uh, Nevada. And one of the things that he is, uh, tries to do is, um, not just sort of present himself as a candidate for political office or political representation for Nevada. He believes in developing a program uh, or presenting uh, a, a program for a development of the state of Nevada. Nevada was in Great Depression or in the doldrums or in what the, the miners called borasca, out of ore and out of luck for 20 years after the failure of the Comstock from 1880 uh, to, uh, uh, to 1900. And Newlands uh, believes that if he could advocate some sort of program for the economic development of Nevada, other than mining, uh, this would be a good platform from which uh, to uh, sort of uh, launch his uh, a political career on a more secure basis in Nevada and ultimately obtain a senatorial seat. Uh, from, uh, from the state. And he looks around and he sees that uh, this is a desert state. Well, obviously it needs irrigation. Uh, it needs reservoirs. It needs water distribution uh, uh, systems. Uh, but it really comes to nothing in the Nevada of the 1890s. The state is simply incapable of financing any sort of program in that way. And uh, that's why Newlands is going to be increasingly turning uh, his eyes to the resources of the federal government uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, come into uh, uh, the West and finance irrigation projects. These cartoons are representative of, uh, a, uh, of a group of cartoons that Senator Stewart had done of, uh, of Newlands, uh, representing him as sort of a aristocratic interloper uh, into Nevada and a rave uh, in, uh, in, in high society. Uh, also, he's always dressed in a plaid suit here uh, with uh, the term anything attached to it. 
And that's to say that Newlands will become anything politically to, uh, to obtain office in Nevada. He will uh, switch from a Democrat in California to a Republican uh, in uh, Nevada. Uh, he will embrace the Silver Party when the Silver Party became the craze in Nevada politics in the mid uh, uh, eight, 1890s. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, of course, he's going to go back ultimately uh, to the, um, um, uh, the Democratic Party uh, by the late 1890s, when the Silver Party essentially fails and also populism fails as a, uh, as, as a third party. And uh, a lot of the uh, pro uh, programs of populism are going to be absorbed by the Democratic Party. Uh, under the leadership of William Jennings Bryan in 1896, uh, particularly the, the uh, idea of free silver that appealed, of course, to, uh, uh, to Nevadans. But the William Jennings uh, 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 Bryan's campaign is going to fail in 1896 too. So we want to move along uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the 20th century here. Uh, uh, and uh, Nevada is going to, as I say, uh, continually lose population. By 1900, it, bare, it had just over 40,000 in the terms of the census. Uh, but this means, and this meant that about 12,000 male voters sent two U.S. senators, or, well, uh, 12, there were about 12,000 voters in Nevada, uh, but they did not send, uh, they, they sent a congressman uh, uh, like Newlands uh, to Washington, D.C., uh, but the voters did not, of course, in uh, the 1890s uh, or the early part of the 20th century uh, send U.S. senators. It was the legislatures uh, who uh, selected senators. Uh, but the point is that Nevada's population was really uh, a very slender population. It was the smallest of any uh, of, the, uh, of the states in the union. And even some suggested that Nevada statehood should be abolished, it should be returned to territorial status, or it really should be given uh, to, uh, uh, to Utah uh, because uh, it was kind of a, uh, a fraud that is, it existed as a state at all. But what occurs as 1900 begins uh, is the 20th century uh, Nevada mining boom. In both, industri in both industrial metals and in precious metals. And by industrial metals, I mean uh, particularly copper uh, in, uh, in the early part of the 1900 and, in, and by precious metals in gold and silver. Uh, and this is going to bring in probably about 50,000 miners and their families uh, to the state, quite a boost to the uh, uh, population. And uh, interestingly, uh, these uh, miners are going to be mostly associated with the Democratic Party. And this is going to be a boost to uh, Newlands uh, as he starts his career as now a Democrat uh, in Nevada uh, in the early part of the, of the 20th century. His work in Congress, however, is going to continue. And he's going to, as I said, sort of realize that it is important to have federal aid to irrigation uh, in the West because the states simply can't do it and certainly Nevada cannot uh, do it. And in 1902, uh, through a lot of lobbying, a lot of uh, breakfasts and entertaining and so on, uh, he is going to be able to put together uh, the Reclamation Act of 19, of, of 192. Uh, and uh, it will be passed by Congress and also the Senate. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt also gave uh, his sort of tacit uh, support uh, uh, to it and uh, uh, is going to uh, 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 want to claim credit for it. Uh, but ultimately, the act is going to be known as the Newlands Act and not just uh, the Reclamation uh, Act of 1902. And one of the first projects in the West is going to be uh, the Truckee Carson uh, project here. We have a map uh, of it there. And basically it's uh, the Truckee River and the, uh, draws water from uh, the Truckee River and the um, um, uh, Carson River. And uh, the Derby Diversion Dam that diverts water from the Truckee River uh, to the Fallon Irrigation Project will be completed in 1905. 
here we have, it's, uh, this looks like it's a very large project, but it is not. It's very small. The Truckee River is a very small uh, uh, river. Uh, and um, we have um, uh, it uh, uh, being opened in, uh, in 1905. If we could have the next slide, I believe. Yes, uh, this is uh, uh, Newlands in the white hat and his wife, Edith, uh, turning one of the cranks that is going to divert water from the Truckee River uh, to the irrigation uh, project uh, in, uh, in Fallon, Nevada. And of course, it diverts water away from the Pyramid uh, uh, Lake uh, Paiute uh, Reservation and threatens the fishery uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the reservation. It's going to be an issue uh, throughout the uh, coming uh, uh, 20th century. Well, anyway, uh, Newlands does achieve the Reclamation Act uh, and uh, he tries to tout that as his uh, major uh, achievement. Uh, the uh, creation of the reclamation, it creates the reclamation service that becomes the major dam building uh, agency uh, in the United States government. Uh, it builds, for instance, the Roosevelt Dam to serve the Salt uh, River project uh, in uh, Arizona. And ultimately, uh, it is the uh, uh, motivation uh, and the engineering capabilities behind the era of the big dam building. And of course, uh, eventually the building of Boulder Dam, Hoover Dam, uh, that is completed during the New Deal. It was started actually under the um, uh, Republican administration of President Hoover prior to uh, Franklin, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And, well, uh, uh, Pro Professor Rowley, I just wanted to quickly interrupt you to let you know that um, we're at 8.15, so. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, well, uh, in, in other words, we have Newlands in Nevada, uh, and now by 1903, by largely by virtue of the passage of that Reclamation Act of 1902, uh, Newlands is able to achieve uh, the appointment of U.S. Senator from Nevada, from the Nevada Legislature. He replaces uh, John uh, uh, John P. Jones and uh, he becomes uh, a member of that most exclusive men's club uh, in, the United, uh, in the United States, the United States Senate. And it is a position from which he can launch uh, his, um, I, I think sort of a, a, a national uh, a political career. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and he takes to uh, the, the national aspects of his political career. Uh, and, uh, and, and seeking out a lot of problems. Uh, he is a Democrat. Uh, he is a progressive Democrat, uh, but he is a, what they call a nationalizing uh, a Democrat. Uh, he, uh, unlike many of the other members of his party, uh, he believes in the power of the federal government not in states' rights. The Democratic Party in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th century, is essentially sort of the backward looking sort of agrarian party uh, of the country. Uh, and the Republican Party is more of the embracing, embraces industrialism uh, and progress. But the progressivism that I'm talking about here that is uh, characteristic of what we call the progressive era from 1900 to the outbreak of World War I, uh, is a movement that cuts across both parties. You can be a progressive Democrat, you can become a, a progressive Republican. Uh, but Newlands was a type of progressive Democrat uh, who really believed that there should be more power in the federal government to solve uh, 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 national problems because he viewed most problems as national problems like conservation, uh, the national forests, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the national parks, uh, the Interstate Commerce uh, 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 Commission and the, and the Trade uh, uh, Commission, all of these, uh, as well as the Federal Reserve System, uh, were all sort of national uh, commissions, national agencies created to address uh, national problems. And uh, this is what really New, uh, uh, Newlands is, uh, uh, message is that uh, we have national problems, we must have national solutions to them. Uh, and uh, 
this is one of the places that he makes a, another uh, a, a sort of jump is that he sees the race problem in this country as a national problem. It should have a national solution. And he believed that one of the uh, parts of that national solution would be the repeal of the 15th Amendment uh, to the uh, uh, Constitution. And he arrives in Chicago uh, with, that, uh, with this amendment uh, in hand uh, and um, uh, it kind of shocks some of the other uh, members of the uh, Democratic Party uh, because basically he was saying is that black people should be excluded from uh, political participation. That the solution that the South had achieved uh, by 1912 in terms of its uh, Jim Crow laws uh, and, uh, it and its exclusions of blacks uh, from uh, the uh, uh, political system uh, should be a national uh, system. And uh, he is, uh, and, and interestingly enough, he is also on the Education Committee, the Senate Education Committee for the District of Columbia, uh, and advocates industrial education uh, for uh, Black children in the schools of Washington, uh, uh, D.C. Uh, so uh, he, in other, he really uh, is going to uh, uh, latch on to this race question. And many newspapers report that uh, perhaps uh, he is um, uh, trying to link the anti-Asian West uh, with the anti-Black South and maybe as a uh, platform from which to uh, uh, sort of seek the presidency in the 1912 uh, Democratic Convention. Because the Democratic Convention in 1912 was very important. It was uh, clear that President Roosevelt in his re-entrance into Republican politics was going to split the Republican Party and offer the Democratic Party the opportunity to win the presidency, the first time that it had that opportunity really uh, since uh, Grover Cleveland. And it was a very uh, uh, a split convention in 1912. And Newlands was thinking in terms of, well, maybe it will be a locked convention uh, and it might turn to him possibly as a uh, uh, alternative uh, a candidate. And he would have this kind of a national uh, and really kind of racist, well, really an outwardly racist program uh, uh, to, uh, to run on. Uh, he generally uh, uh, poo-pooed the idea of a uh, person from a small state as Nevada being nominated for the presidency, but he did complete uh, he did write an acceptance speech uh, it, just in case that the a nomination might be offered him uh, in uh, 1912. The, uh, it, it's hard to make these conclusions uh, uh, in terms of uh, emphasizing his uh, racial views uh, for a person who uh, on almost every other subject uh, is going to be seen as a model uh, a progressive, uh, as an ideal progressive, supporting all of the causes that uh, progressivism is supposed to stand for, uh, greater democracy in American life, more regulation of the trusts and the monopolies, uh, and uh, higher uh, and, and uh, protection of the uh, weaker members of society, children, uh, injured workmen, uh, women, uh, and, and some of the general programs of progressivism. Uh, Newlands could check them all off. Uh, but on race, uh, this is something uh, that becomes a, uh, a, a hobby horse of his, you might say, uh, that, that, that stands out uh, for uh, various reasons that are, are sometimes hard to explain, but he does become uh, almost obsessed with it. And the newspapers, a lot of newspapers throughout the country are really surprised uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with this stand that, race, uh, that uh, Newlands takes. But yet uh, it, um, 
it is emblematic of a lot of other things, uh, of, of a lot of other people and uh, movements in the country uh, uh, that, uh, in their attitudes towards race and the exclusion of peoples of color from, uh, from politics. Uh, and Newlands, however, is going to be an influencer uh, in, uh, in, in, that, um, in that direction. Uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting that, um, uh, that, the, uh, that the film uh, Birth of the Nation comes out in 1915 and that the second clan is born is particularly in the border states of the South uh, in, uh, in, in 1915. Uh, and so the nation is sort of going in a kind of direction in which you might say that uh, the North uh, and the West, I guess, has bought the Southern view uh, of reconstruction uh, and the Southern view of where people of color uh, and black people should be in a subordinate uh, position uh, in American society. And Newland certainly lent his voice to that position uh, in these latter years of his life as well as being a well-recognized progressive. I think that uh, will conclude my uh, talk tonight, uh, but yet let's look at how I concluded some of my observations in my book 25 years ago or so. Newlands's legacy. Newlands achieved the promises of American life. He achieved wealth, family, and wide ranging political influence. What he realized personally, he saw for American society as well. His record, however, strikingly indicates that people of color were excluded. His vision of a modern racially exclusive future was not uncommon to people of his background and class at the turn of the century. That it was the wrong vision would have come as a surprise uh, to him. And quite frankly, I think he would may have been disappointed uh, in the future 20th century in America. Uh, but we don't know that. He might have had a conversion of some type. Uh, in any event, that's my very hurried view uh, of Newlands's life and his embracement of progressivism uh, and a white America by the beginnings of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Riley, for such an engaging talk. Uh, we do have um, quite a few questions that um, I've been taking in uh, this whole time. So I've kind of collated them and uh, combined a few. Um, but I think one, one that's come up several times um, uh, is just how, how did you get interested? Um, you know, how did you, what drew you to the subject of Newlands? Um, and then also what sort of sources um, and kind of research did you do uh, to put together your book and your work on Newlands? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Well, um, I at, at the University of Nebraska, I grew up on the West Coast in the Puget Sound area. I, were, I was born in the Midwest and so on. My family was a part of the World War II migration uh, to the uh, West Coast. Uh, but uh, I did take my uh, graduate work uh, at the University of Nebraska and became interested in agricultural history. Uh, and after I got my PhD, uh, I uh, uh, wanted to get as close back to the Pacific Coast as possible. Uh, uh, and uh, Reno, Nevada uh, uh, was uh, uh, close to the Pacific uh, Coast, close to, uh, uh, to the Pacific Northwest too. Uh, and uh, I looked around Nevada and with my uh, background in agricultural history, I said, well, what, what does Nevada have to offer agriculturally? Well, uh, uh, these uh, reclamation projects uh, that were uh, uh, founded by um, uh, uh, Francis Newlands or the Reclamation Act of 1902. Uh, this uh, uh, interested me ter uh, tremendously uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Newlands's name came up over and over again as being uh, an important person uh, here uh, in uh, the creation of 
uh, irrigation projects. Irrigation projects uh, in the 1890s become reclamation projects uh, in the uh, uh, in the 20th century. The sources in terms of uh, Newlands has a great file of personal and political papers at the Yale uh, in at Yale, the Sterling Library at, at Yale. Uh, there's the Barland uh, uh, Newlands papers at the University of uh, or the State Historical Society of Wisconsin uh, in, in Madison. These were very uh, rich uh, resources uh, for me. Uh, and of course, the uh, uh, Congressional Record uh, and uh, National Archives uh, for the uh, Reclamation Act and the legislation uh, in the uh, 20th century uh, in the National Archives uh, in Maryland. Uh, and downtown Washington, D.C. I think they were, uh, when I was doing this research, a lot of them were located in downtown National Archives. So uh, personal Newlands paper, newspapers, of course, uh, from uh, throughout the country, local newspapers. Uh, and uh, uh, th this is basically uh, what I based the, most of my research upon, personal papers, newspapers, and government archives. Great, thank you. Um, as, so someone wrote, um, William Stewart's um, campaign cartoons attacking Newlands um, uh, are pretty harsh. Um, how, so how would you compare the two senators um, kind of in terms of their work for um, Nevada and then also for the nation? Uh, well, Newlands would like to see himself different uh, uh, from, uh, from Stewart. Uh, he uh, uh, thought of himself as a, a, a modern politician and Stewart was more crass and so on. He was basically a servant of the Central Pacific Railroad in California, the Southern Pacific Railroad in California. He served two uh, terms as, uh, as uh, oil, uh, uh, two periods of when he was Senator uh, from Nevada in the early years, right after statehood, uh, uh, but he was still essentially the railroad senator uh, from California in, in Nevada. Uh, and then in his latter ones, he was also, he, he went back to California and then the railroad brought him uh, back into Nevada in 1888 uh, so that he could go back to uh, Washington uh, as a senator to essentially defend the railroad's um, uh, interests after the passage of the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887. Uh, so he was very much a servant of power. And Newland saw himself as quite different from that. Uh, he wanted to come into Nevada, uh, to Nevada and launch uh, public service programs like uh, let's, let's try to have irrigation, uh, let's try to have uh, a, a remodeling of our tax system uh, in Nevada. He, uh, and, and let's call in experts to sort of analyze these problems and try to solve them and to build what he called a model commonwealth in Nevada after, 19, uh, after 1903. Uh, and he supported such things in Nevada like the anti-gambling law. Uh, Nevada was, uh, had the strongest anti-gambling law in 1909 of any state in the, in the country. And this was part of the morality legislation of, of progressivism that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, and, uh, oh yes, and, and also in one other thing, uh, the progressives thought of themselves as modern and efficient uh, uh, and uh, they oftentimes did not have beards and Newlands did not have a beard. Uh, Senator Stewart always had a full beard. When he was young, he had, it was very red, uh, a red beard. Uh, when he was old, of course, it was quite gray, but it's still a straggly beard. Well, Newlands, as a modern, uh, forward-looking progressive, is going to be clean, uh, clean shaven. Of course, there were jokes that uh, Newlands couldn't grow a beard too, you know. So that that uh, uh, that that was that, that was something too, and that was associated with Newlands's uh, 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 sort of. Uh, uh, constantly vacationing in England with his very uh, toddy ta relation uh, in uh, in England, which didn't go over very well uh, in um, uh, in frontier Nevada. Great, I think along those lines, um, just uh, thinking about um, you know. Uh, his, you know, political parties and everything. Um, could you maybe speak just, uh, just briefly a little bit more about kind of what the, you know, what progressive, what progressivism was at that time, um, and then also kind of tacking onto that, uh, you mentioned uh, William uh, William Jennings Bryan, um, and someone was asking if uh, Newlands ever met him. You know, I, 
I, I would imagine he did uh, because Brian was always around Washington, but I never came across an exact uh, uh, evidence that, that, uh, uh, that he did. Um, Newlands uh, embraced the silver cause, as did uh, the Democratic Party uh, in uh, 1896. He never really was thrilled about it. Uh, let, let's put it. Uh, let's put it that way. He did it more, and I think Senator Stewart was quite accurate on that. Uh, it, it, to become anything, you know, to keep his uh, uh, political career in Nevada intact. Uh, but the silver cause is going to start to fade uh, uh, by the late 1890s and gradually merge into the democratic fuse, what they call the fusion movement uh, into the uh, 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 Democratic Party. Uh, but, um, but it is important to say that uh, Newlands is going to remain a, uh, 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 come back into Nevada as a Democrat. Uh, and not as, as, as a Republican. In other words, he's reasserting uh, what I think he probably uh, learned, uh, the, ten, uh, the, the political sort of viewpoints that he learned from or Orville H. Browning way back in Washington, uh, D.C. is more akin to the Democratic Party on a lot of issues and particularly on race. So, so oh, you wanted on progressivism, no. Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, well, progressivism, uh, I often say that progressivism is sort of the uh, 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 populism in many ways of the reform of populism uh, gone to the city, becoming much more urbane rather than having the shaggy agrarianism uh, uh, about it that populism uh, did as a political party. And it was a political party uh, in, the, uh, in the 1890s. Uh, but it's generally going to fail, and, uh, and the Democratic Party's adoption of silver and cer certainly fails uh, in 1896. And uh, it has to, uh, have, and progressivism is one of these responses to industrialism. This is one of my themes, too. And Newlands wants to be uh, in that progressive response uh, to uh, industrialism. And it really stands for more democratization of the political process direct democracy, initiative, referendum, recall on the local uh, uh, level, direct uh, election of senators rather ha than having this, uh, the legislature uh, el elect uh, uh, senators, even women's suffrage, broadening the suffrage. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, in terms of economics, uh, it stands for regulation of, um, uh, of, of corporations uh, and big government uh, can uh, 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 the uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Newlands's idea about regulating the, uh, the corporations was that big government needed to do it through some sort of, uh, 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 some sort of agencies like the Federal Trade uh, uh, Commission, rather than just having uh, one uh, uh, anti-monopolistic uh, uh, court, uh, uh, court case after, uh, after another. And, uh, uh, but of course the classical economics uh, argument is that you leave it alone, you leave the economy alone and competition uh, will uh, keep businesses small uh, and will prevent the concentration of the uh, conglomeration of economic power. Competition will do it. Well, competition doesn't, the laissez-faire situation kind of breeds uh, uh, the growth of, um, uh, of conglomerates rather than uh, regulates. The, the, uh, the invisible hand does not always regulate uh, uh, the, uh, the growth of conglomerates. Then uh, beyond economics, um, uh, and, and, and in that, well, under that economics, I, per I perhaps should say there's two sort of versions of progressivism. Uh, one is more uh, democratic, the new freedom that Newlands will, or that will, uh, President Wilson will espouse. Uh, and, um, uh, and the new nationalism uh, that uh, President Roosevelt uh, will, uh, will uh, back. Uh, Newlands's ideas were more akin to President Roosevelt's new nationalism, interestingly enough, because he's a nationalizing Democrat uh, than, the, um, uh, than the, uh, the new freedom uh, uh, that, uh, that Wilson was talking about and that um, uh, 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 Justice Brandeis uh, uh, 
adv advocated. And the new freedom was more of uh, uh, let competition take uh, place uh, and, and, not, uh, and, and really try to keep the conglomerate small uh, and, and rather than let them sort of grow, uh, but yet regulate them. Uh, there is a difference in these two brands, but um, uh, well, any, that can get pretty complicated. Uh, but anyway, let's go to the third part uh, is a social uplift part of progressivism. Uh, the protection of the weaker members of society, injured workmen, uh, women, uh, children. Uh, and also if we can protect uh, people uh, in this, uh, we can also protect people from themselves in terms of morality legislation, like prohibition, like anti-gambling laws, anti-prostitution laws. Uh, these are parts of the progressive. Uh, uh, in other words, good government, good society, good morals and, and such. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I want to, um, again, we have so many questions, um, but I want to, I really want to get to, um, you know, new, back to Newland's views on race, uh, oh, which yeah. you covered. Which you covered. Um, could you talk a little bit about his, um, um, his, his, you know, possible um, anti-Semitism um, views? Um, you know, you, you talked quite a bit about um, Black Americans, um, but yeah. that's definitely a topic that, that people are, are asking about. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't get, I, I don't get any real, uh, I didn't get any real evidence uh, of that. Of course, there is the fact that he did vote against the confirmation of, uh, of Justice Brandeis for the uh, uh, Supreme Court, the first Jewish, uh, Jewish person to be on the uh, uh, Supreme Court. Uh, one could also argue uh, that uh, that he disagreed with uh, the new freedom uh, that uh, Brandeis was sort of the intellectual uh, 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 father of uh, in, in the way that Herbert Crowley uh, in his book, The Promise of American Life was the father of uh, Roosevelt's new nationalism or the intellectual uh, 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 creator of, uh, of these uh, approaches uh, to, uh, uh, to progressivism. Uh, but um, I, I would suspect, yes, that uh, uh, Newlands is, has racist views, and I would suspect that they would include uh, 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 the Jewish issue, and particularly a lot of the new immigrants from, uh, uh, from Eastern Europe, of which the Jews were a part uh, in, uh, uh, in, in this period. And if we can remember that uh, President Wilson was rather, uh, had written some very anti-immigrant uh, uh, things, uh, uh, pieces too. And uh, Newlands and Wilson were, uh, they felt that they were, uh, that Newlands felt he was quite intellectually close to Wilson actually, in terms of, of president, much more so than Brian. Brian was too uh, much of a Hustings type politician for Newlands. So, so, stay, so staying on that topic um, of race, um, you know, so not only, um, you know, it's it's across across the nation. Um, you know, organizations are um, disassociating themselves um, with historical figures that that had segregationist views. Um, you know, I know that that's happening in Reno there as well. Um, do you, yeah, what are your your views as a, a Newland scholar? Um, you know, on kind of that um, disassociation. At 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 first, you know, I I sort of think, well, come on, you know, uh, it was in the air. Uh, you know, why single out a certain person and such uh, for it. Uh, but then as I start thinking about it, uh, no one's, he really enjoyed a great deal of privilege uh, and, and he became one of the shaper of ideas and so on. Uh, and, uh, and as from that position of privilege, I think comes great responsibility uh, and, I, and I think he should have been a deeper thinker than, than he was uh, on, on it. Uh, and, but regardless of that, uh, he carries responsibility uh, from his position of privilege that, that he achieved uh, through marriage, but also by hard work too. There's no, there's no doubt uh, uh, about that. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, I, but I do think, uh, uh, he, uh, he, he carries a responsibility and, and therefore I think uh, a judgment can be made on him and against that. 
Uh, and, uh, and I think you're referring also to monuments and so on in that question too. Should we you know, continue to have monuments and so on? Well, and, I'm, and my thinking has, has kind of changed on that too, or, or has become more complicated on that, uh, is that monuments are really not history. Uh, they really reflect uh, uh, the, the period of time and the ideas and values of certain people in a particular, uh, 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 in a particular time. Uh, and um, uh, they're, they're, they're not necessarily history. And by taking down certain monuments, we're not really uh, erasing history. Great, so we, we just only have time for two more um, questions. So um, someone asked, um, you know, given your, your research with Newlands, um, do you have any idea of, you know, his, um, um, let's see here, his experience, um, you know, with black Americans, um, you know, kind of throughout his, his life? Uh, actually, he has more experience with uh, Asian Americans. Uh, that he does with, uh, with, with black Americans. Uh, uh, I, I don't think it would, I didn't come across any, uh, 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 let's see, he was, um, I think he admired, what was it, the Booker T. Washington uh, uh, and, uh, and George Washington Carver uh, and, and such. Uh, I don't think he would admire Du Bois though. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, and the, uh, if you understand the, or, or we understand the, uh, uh, the differences uh, uh, there, uh, but um, uh, he definitely uh, had to uh, sort of take an uh, anti-Asian stand, even though the Sharon state always employed Chinese. Uh, uh, he did uh, make a pledge when he was trying to be the nominee of the Democratic Party, uh, in California for the Senate that the Sharon estate would dismiss all of the Chinese employers and employees. Uh, and they had over 500 um, if he got uh, uh, the a Senate nomination uh, from uh, California. So he was willing to, uh, uh, to dismiss the Chinese. Uh, um, and, and he saw, but, and, but I, I think really he saw in the 1870s, even in California, the power of race. Uh, and how it was an issue uh, in uh, in politics, and um, and and I think he also saw that maybe as a uh, a nationwide platform that he perhaps could launch uh, a uh, by by circumstance or happenstance uh, a uh, a bid for the presidency in the Nevada or in the Democratic National Convention of 1912. Great. Well, so unfortunately, we just have one uh, one final question. Um, what advice might you give to your history students um, as they write about prominent historical figures, um, especially those like Newlands, um, who had such deeply held uh, racist beliefs? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm out of the classroom, of course, <laughs> kind of conveniently so these days. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I would uh, urge them to try to understand them in their period uh, and uh, the influence they had uh, and, uh, uh, and, and not be hesitant to make judgments actually too, uh, because we do write history and we can't write history entirely uh, from the ivory tower. Uh, uh, and and uh, even though we think we're sort of writing totally objective history in terms of this one side, this is, the other side and so on. We do strive for that, uh, but ultimately I think we have to come uh, to some sort of conclusions. And I would say, don't shy away from the conclusions. Life is too short. <laughs> well, th thank you so much for, um, for spending your time with us this evening, um, Professor Raleigh. Uh, we did have several questions, obviously, that we weren't able to get to um, in our time uh, tonight, but we will try to answer them um, in our follow-up email to our attendees. Um, so I'd like to turn it uh, back to CCHS President Mary Sheehan uh, for a thank you and farewell. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Rowley, uh, for such an enlightening and enjoyable presentation. And many thanks to our audience as well for the thoughtful questions uh, and for spending part of your evening with us. 
Uh, please do watch for our follow-up email uh, with the link to the recording of today's program and an evaluation form. Uh, thanks again to all and good night.